Right off the bat, that is an extremely, and excuse me for using this term, extremely fat sound. But even so, you can hear there's something special about the triangle. I wish I had my oscilloscope set up, and it would probably just look like a normal triangle, but there's something else in there. There's something sweeter than a normal triangle. That is just three triangle waves, and it sounds that good with the filter all the way open. Um, one of the great things about the Mini Moog is this waveform here. I don't know the official name for it. It's like a bent triangle wave, but it has a really wonderful sound. Here, let's just listen to one of them. It has a thick bottom and a nasal top. It's very strange. Here's two of them atop each other in the same octave. You probably hear that I need to have my key contacts clean. That's something I need to look into. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that strange waveform down on the bottom, but we do have very nice sawtooth waveforms like these. Very raspy. Let's hear two of them. This synthesizer has no built-in effects, so it's completely dry. Um, but what I might do when I edit the video is add just a little bit of reverb for the benefit of those of you that are listening on headphones, because it does sound just a little bit, cuts straight through your brain. This thing is so bright and so punchy and powerful. A little bit of reverb might just uh, calm it down a little bit. No Ooh, a bit more bite on this one.
here, the Korg M1. I was a lucky owner back in the day. It came out in 1988 and uh, it was really, really successful. Everyone had this in the studio. There were tons of hits uh, done on this from R&B to house. Back then, memory was still very expensive. These synthesizers would have, like, the, like also the D50, they would have a little piece of sample and then the sustain was synthesized based on one sample only. This is a sine wave. A sine wave is the basic building block of sound. Any sound can be constructed by combining several sine waves in different frequencies. The sine wave gets its name from the sinusoid function, which describes a circle in two dimensions. Since sound only exists on one dimension, the time dimension, the graph cannot go back on itself to create a real circle. So basically, a sine wave is audio's circle. Just as you can create a complete drawing from small dots, you can also create any sound conceivable by mixing together several sine oscillators. Let's listen to the sine oscillator. When I play high notes, more wave cycles are compressed into the view. This is because high frequencies are shorter and our graph has a set time window. If we play low notes, we can see that there are less cycles in our view. This is because they are slower and they take more time to evolve. Let's look at the sign in our frequency analyzer. As you can see, the sign only has one peak and has no frequency content on any side of the spectrum. This is why a sine wave is often referred as a pure tone, as it is the only sound that consists of a single basic frequency. This basic frequency is called the fundamental frequency. If we look at other wave shapes, such as the SO or square, well, now we are looking at a SO wave on an oscilloscope. If we look at the frequency analysis of the sound, we can see that it has many spikes. Those spikes are extra high frequencies that construct the sound's timbre. Those are called overtones. Overtones construct each sound that we hear each day. Overtones can be harmonic or non-harmonic. Non-harmonic overtones result in noise or sounds with ambiguous pitch. 
while harmonic overtones support the fundamental frequency and keep its tonality intact. So as you can already guess, we can make a so oscillator out of many sine oscillators. The lowest frequency of the sound is the basics on which the sound is built and is called the fundamental frequency. The rest of the spikes here are called overtones. Harmonic overtones will always be the fundamental frequency multiplied by a whole number. Let's take for example the note A, 110 Hz. It has a fundamental frequency of 110 Hz and its first harmonic is its fundamental frequency, 110 Hz. Its second harmonic would be the frequency times 2, which means 220 Hz. The third one will be 330 Hz times 4 times 5 and so on. The, the idea behind the system is to keep our wave cycle repetitive and the only way to do that is to have the overtones start and finish at the same phase of the fundamental frequency. As you can see here, we have a green, blue, we have small sine waves here that represent the harmonics of the sound. The first harmonic would be the fundamental frequency. The second harmonic has two cycles per one cycle of the fundamental frequency and because of that it starts and it ends at the same point and it's the same with the third harmonic which has three cycles per one or here we have four cycles per one and you can actually follow it it's pretty accurate and so on to infinity let's listen to those harmonics Does it sound musically familiar? Of course it does. This is the building block of all music. It occurs naturally in nature and it exists in all human music. Personally for me it reminds uh, an Indian flute or something like this. Let's see how a saw wave is constructed from many sine oscillators by adding them one by one. Let's start with the fundamental frequency and now we add the second harmonic third harmonic, as you can see there are three slides here, and it's starting to resemble a so shape. We are going to add this harmonic here. And I could go on forever, but uh, my CPU doesn't have enough horsepower and 16 is enough to demonstrate the idea. A saw wave has all of the harmonics, but not all waves have to have all of the harmonics. For instance, the square does not have any even harmonics. It skips the 2, 4, 6, 8 and so on of the harmonics, adding only the odd harmonics. So 1 is the odd harmonic. As you can see, two, we're not mixing inside, we're skipping it, straight to three. And voila, it starts to look like a square. We skip the fourth harmonic, fifth we add in, we skip the sixth, we add the seventh, and so on. Let's look at the same thing on the frequency analyzer. Here is a saw wave. This is our fundamental frequency and now we're going to add the overtones. Let's look at our square wave. The first one, second one we skip, 
third, fifth, seventh. Let's look at the relations between frequencies. I have selected 220 Hz as my fundamental frequency, and my next overtone will be an octave higher, the fr fundamental frequency times 2. That's 440 Hz. The next overtone will be a fifth higher than the second overtone, or an octave and a fifth higher than the fundamental. The fourth one will be two octaves higher than the fundamental and a perfect fourth higher than the previous overtone. And as you can see, as I go up the overtones, the interval with the previous overtones gets smaller and smaller and smaller. As I go up, it reaches microtone. The recipe for making a classic SO oscillator is having each overtone's amplitude divided by its harmonic count. So for instance, the first overtone would be on maximum volume, the second one would be half the volume, third one would be third the volume, you can see it here also, and so on. So theoretically a SOW wave should have infinite overtones. Distortion is when an output signal of an audio effect differs from the input signal. Wait, what? Isn't that every audio effect ever? Technically, yes. But the distortion we're talking about today can be described as nonlinear changes to a waveform's amplitude, which ultimately introduces harmonic and or inharmonic overtones. In order to explain the science behind this, let's explore some popular variations of distortion and the slew of fancy names that come along with it. The most basic type of distortion is when an audio signal's amplitude is boosted past a certain threshold and creates a distorted version of the waveform. You might have heard this described as clipping. Before the digital age, mix engineers back in the day used to push analog tape machines or tube amps to achieve this type of distortion. The audio signals would reach the maximum level on these machines and create a soft clipping of the waveform. For example, here we have a sine wave and we're going to put it through some soft clipping. You'll notice as we boost the amplitude of the sine wave and approach the threshold, the waveform gets squashed and somewhat resembles a square wave, but with rounded corners. This soft clipping of the sine wave creates a handful of harmonics above the fundamental frequency and makes the sound's timbre much brighter. You may have heard this type of distortion referred to as analog warmth or saturation. It is the most subtle form of distortion and is highly sought after and emulated in today's digital world. As we do enter the digital world, this introduces a new concept, hard clipping. With hard clipping, when we drive the amplitude of our sine wave past the same threshold, the highest peaks of the waveform get chopped off completely. You can also think of this as hitting a brick wall and getting flattened. This time it does create what looks like a perfect square wave with very, very sharp edges. This hard clipping of the waveform creates some more high frequency harmonics than soft clipping did, and if pushed to the extremes can sound harsh or sometimes obnoxiously bad depending on the incoming sound. You may have accidentally encountered this type of clipping if you've ever pushed your mix level into the red, creating a digitally distorted sound. One additional thing to note about clipping, both soft and hard clipping can directly be compared to limiters and compressors when talking about limiting the dynamic range of a sound at a certain threshold. However, limiters and compressors are traditionally used to achieve this very effect without any of the harmonic side effects that clipping introduces, but it is useful to know that they act in very similar manners. That's so you can see what's going on. So our audio signal is traveling up this curve and is tailing off. Uh, it's a very rounded corner right now because it is an analog clip or a soft clipping. All right, so if we change the shaper mode to digital clip, we will emulate the hard clipping like before. The first thing you'll notice is that the transfer curve is much sharper on this, this cut here. Um, and what this, this will do is this is where our signal will travel up and then just get flat lined uh, and create that harsh corners in our oscilloscope here. Uh, so let's test this out real quick.
gosh. An envelope is a tool that helps us automate aspects of the sound. It generates a slow and evolving waveform, which can then be used to modulate different parameters of our synthesizer, such as volume, pitch, and timbre. The ADSR envelope gets its name after its four stages, attack, decay, sustain, and release. The attack, decay, and release are all time parameters, while the sustain is an amount or level parameter. The attack time describes the time it takes to gradually fade from minimum to maximum. This stage steps into action the moment you play a note. Longer attack times will fade in slowly, while shorter attack times will fade in faster, even instantaneously if you wish. And of course you have all of the attacks in the middle. The decay stage switches in once the attack is finished and it describes the time it takes to gradually fade from the maximum position, which is the end of the attack stage, to the level of the sustain. Let me remind you that the sustain is a level parameter. A short decay will result in a fast drop to the sustain level once the attack stage has finished. A long decay will slowly fade to the sustain level. The sustain stage is not a time parameter, it is infinite in time. Once an envelope has finished going through the attack and decay stages, the sustain stage will stay at its level as long as you keep your MIDI note held. As you see, I'm still holding the note, and once I let go of the note, it will switch to the release stage. The release stage controls the time it takes to fade out from the position of the envelope once we let go of our MIDI note until it reaches zero. Now I'm holding the key and once I release my key it will gradually fade. Short release times will result in a fast drop to zero. While long release times will fade out slowly once the MIDI key is let go. Now that we've described the envelope's parameters, let's look at some common uses for the envelope. The envelope is used to modulate the parameters of a synthesizer. What do I mean by that? Synthesizers have an array of parameters to control the sound. Each knob on a synthesizer is such a parameter. For instance, in this case, I've chosen to enable modulation for two parameters. One is the pitch of the oscillator, and one is the filter cutoff. To make the parameters follow the movement of the envelope, all I need to do is to turn the modulation knob up. The purple bar located on the pitch knob helps us visualize the actual position of the pitch parameter. If I turn the modulation knob up, I get a bigger modulation range. Any parameter you modulate acts as an offset to the modulation. For instance, if I move the knob up, this new position will act as the starting point for the envelope. If I move it down, the other position will act as a starting point for the envelope. To tune the envelope's modulation range correctly, first turn the modulation knob off, then tune your desired minimum with the main parameters knob, in this case the pitch knob. Ok, this is the low note I want to reach, and now boost the sustain up, wait for the sustain to reach maximum, and now while you're on sustain and it's on maximum you can tune the maximum of your envelope. This means that this here 
will be the maximum the envelope will ever reach, no matter how I tune it. So let's see now. That's great. Now the envelope is acting exactly the way I want it to. It has the right minimum and the right maximum. Remember, the parameter provides an offset for the modulation. Let's try the same thing with the cutoff modulation. This is the knob, and we want to move it with the envelope. Notice that the cutoff, like many parameters in the synthesizer, has an end point. It reaches a maximum. This is a ceiling point that it cannot push through. It cannot go over this point. So, however modulation you push, the sound will not be altered if you select the maximum as your starting point for the modulation. This is a common mistake in envelope tuning and you should avoid it. Remember, you need to set your maximum with the modulation knob and this maximum should not exceed the maximum of the original parameter. Let's talk about some general points about the behavior of the envelope. First of all, when the sustain is on maximum, the decay value is meaningless. Why is it meaningless? Because if you remember, the decay is the time it takes to reach from maximum to the level of the sustain. Since the sustain is on maximum, the decay will just move from maximum to maximum and will have no effect. Let's look at the graph. Once I trigger a note, there is a, there is a white line that where the envelope is. And try to listen if you hear any difference between a long decay or a short decay. That's right, there is no difference. When the sustain is on maximum, the decay value is meaningless. Now I made a long envelope. And if we look at the white line while I play a note, we will see that once I release the note, it will jump straight to the release stage, no matter at what stage I was in the envelope. However, this graph is a bit, bit misleading because the release does not start from the level of the sustain, but rather from the level the envelope was when I left the note. So for instance, if I play a short note, and let it go quickly, the envelope will not have time to rise to the maximum and the release will continue this low level until the fade out once I release the note. If I let it go to maximum, the release will continue from there. Let's talk about some classic envelopes. Classic envelopes are envelopes that are commonly used, mimic some real instruments, and are very useful. The first envelope I want to describe is the string or bell envelope. Strings and bells, once plucked or hit, have to decay, and once they are hit, you cannot control their volume. This means that the sustain has to be on zero, because no bell or string has an infinite sustain. The attack has to be zero, since all of the strings start abruptly and then decay slowly. And the decay has to be long. The release also has to be long, if we want to imitate a string that cannot be damped. Like the strings of the harp, or a bell. The next envelope is a piano envelope, or a guitar bass envelope. This envelope is similar to the string envelope, only it has zero release. This means that whenever the player wants to, he can let go of the note, and the sound will stop. Just like a piano that uses dampers, or a bass guitar when you lift up your finger to stop the note. What you're hearing now, the small clicks, is a common problem with envelopes. Envelopes are originally intended to create slowly evolving waveforms. Those waveforms are usually much lower than audio rate. In our case, we have the attack set to zero and the release set to zero. The clicks are because the envelope is cutting the sound too abruptly. The speed of the envelope, once it is faster than the original sound, for instance, if you have a wave that has a cycle speed, if the envelope rises faster than it, then you will hear a small click. 
The easy way to fix it is just to tune your attack and release times to be a bit longer. This is the bass envelope. My favorite and most simple envelope is the lead envelope. The lead envelope is as loud as it can be for the longest duration it can be. It is also called a get envelope. It has a zero attack time, zero release time, or at least the minimum possible without getting a click. Maximum sustain. I use it for making sounds that need to stick out. I know the synthesizer is not the best, but it's just for demonstrating the basics. On this envelope, the decay does not matter, of course. As we said earlier. Another envelope that is very useful is the pad envelope. Pad envelope is a long attack and long release and full sustain. This enables the synthesizer to fade in and out while the player lifts his fingers off the keyboard. One last envelope that is used often is very similar to the piano envelope, only much shorter. This is the sequence envelope. This is a very short, pizzicato-like envelope. It is used for creating sequences and fast accompaniment parts. Several things not to do in an envelope. First of all, before you tune the knobs, think what kind of envelope do you want. Second of all, never tune your sustain to the middle area unless you know what you're doing and know what kind of result you're expecting. In 80% of the cases, the sustain should be on maximum or on minimum. Sustain in the middle zone, especially when the envelope controls the amplifier, is rarely used and is not very natural sounding. A closed envelope will usually give you just a small click. This is because the attack is very fast and the decay is very fast and it just increases and decreases the envelope very quickly enough to just let a small click pass through. For making punchy sounds, you would usually want to have your attack on zero. If you want to have less punchy sounds, you would open your attack a bit. That's it for the basics of the envelope. This is the time to go and practice your envelopes. I have to remind you that the amplifier envelope is the single most important module on any synthesizer. This is the module that defines how our brain interprets this sound, what kind of instrument it is. If you want to download this uh, small gadget to experiment with an ADSR and turn the knobs yourself, you can do it on synthschool.com. I hope you enjoyed this short video. Happy patching! And last but not least, just for this plugin, there are many more types of filters, but I'm going to concentrate on these uh, types of filters at the moment, is the vowel filter. By taking several types of filters, as you've seen, most filters here are constructed by uh, adding a, a very basic building block of the low pass filter together to create a new type of filter. If we add two low pass filters, we get a 12 dB uh, low pass. If we add a high pass and a low pass, we will get a band pass. And here we have three band passes that create a very interesting effect. Yes, that's a formant filter, a vowel filter, and it creates uh, a speaking like uh, sound uh, or a vocal type of sound. And it's done by uh, taking three bandpass filters 
and locating them in special locations. We usually just uh, record a uh, person speaking and uh, then uh, we just analyze the sound and see at which uh, syllable uh, which frequency was uh, was louder and which frequency was uh, lower and then we can recreate this by using three bandpass filters and here you, you have the result that's a um, vocal filter if you google the following phrase formant table then the first place you will reach click on the first link and you will see a small table and this table is exactly what you need to create a formant filter what we have here is actually the frequencies in Hertz that you should type into the filters cutoff so if you have three band passes, you can use, by the way, you can use your own EQ at home and try this out, it's going to work. Then you type, for instance, if you want a tenor voice to say ah, then you need at least the three first filters. You don't need all of the five filters. They're indicated by F1, F2, F3, F4, and F5. The first one, uh, the first three are the most important. If you take only three bands, it's enough for you to hear this uh, kind of sound. So you take an EQ and then, atten and then uh, accentuate the following frequencies. 650, 180, and 2650. This will give you a, a an A. If you take another, uh, this the same EQ and create another uh, type of uh, sound, another type of setting between three uh, bell filters, 400, 1700, and 2600 hertz on three filters separately, then you will get uh, a different sounding, uh, an E vowel. And here you also have, uh, if you want to be really precise, and but you don't really have to tune, you don't have really to you don't really have to use these uh, parameters to get these uh, vocal sounds. You, you can only use the three, the three first parameters here. But if, you're really, um, uh, if you really want to dive deep, you, can, you also he here have the velocity, the amplitude of each filter. Zero would be the loudest, minus six would be two times uh, softer, minus seven would be a bit less than that, and so on. And you also have the bandwidth. The bandwidth is how much, how resonating the bandpass is. So you can use the resonance uh, to tune the resonance according to this or Q if you're using a, if you're using a uh, an EQ. So this recipe is perfect. Let me give you the. Here you can see the address, and I'll repeat just how I got there. On Google, I just type the words formant table. Okay, this formant table. There, uh, by the way, there are lots of formant tables. Uh, I found uh, some formant tables with even uh, vowels like M, N, R. L and long, uh, they're not vowels, but long, uh, long word, uh, long letters. Mm, mm. Very interesting sites on the web uh, regarding four months. By the way, why is this happening? Why is, uh, why uh, are uh, are these four months uh, different for each letter? Four months are created by uh, a resonating body. We ha our mouth is a resonating body. And it uh, it changes its shape and its size all the time, and the the shape of the sound uh, and size of the resonating body uh, will also change the resonating properties of the body. But which frequencies it resonates? Which frequencies are louder and which frequencies are softer? Um, and this kind of filter, for instance, this is the difference between a good guitar, a bad guitar. And this is the difference between A, E, E, O, U, each vowels that we we speak. 